Hello students! Today we are going to continue with the unit on classification and we're going to be looking at lesson two, the six kingdoms and three domains of life. So moving along, we're going to start with some vocab. So the word taxon or taxa for plural is a category into which related organisms are placed and there is a hierarchy of groups um, or taxa from broadest to most specific. So in taxonomy, we are going to study these groups or taxa, and we're gonna see which one is the broadest and which one is the most specific. So let's take a look at that. So we start with domain, which is the broadest group or the broadest taxa, and there are three domains, followed by kingdom, which there are six kingdoms, followed by phylum or division if you're um, classifying a plant, followed by class, followed by order, then family, then genus, and then species. And here we see that the broadest taxon is domain, and oops, sorry, and the most specific is species. So um, let's do an activity here. What if I ask you to classify in hierarchy humans? what would be the um, taxonomic classification of humans. So our broadest domain, which we can include lots of other organisms, would be the domain eukarya, because our cells are eukaryotic cells. We are in the kingdom um, animalia, or animal, because we are animals. We are in the phylum chordata, because we have a backbone, subphylum vertebrata. We are in the class mammalia, or mammals, because of different characteristics that makes us mammals. We are in the um, order uh, primate, so we share that classification with other primates, like um, chimps. We are in the family hominid, like all those other hominid species that we looked at during our evolution unit. We are in the genus Homo and species Sapiens, and there's even a subspecies for us humans. Um, so we are Homo sapiens sapiens, um, and that's our name, right? So our binomial nomenclature name, our scientific name for a human is a Homo sapien. And we all agree, because of taxonomy, because of the rules of classifications, that we as human beings, our scientific name is Homo sapiens. So um, if we look at another example, if we look at the example of the grizzly bear, the gris grizzly bear's name is the Ursus arctos. So Ursus would be the genus of the grizzly bear and Arctos will be the, um, oops, forgot the C, would be the species name of the grizzly bear. So notice that, um, like I was telling you before, domain, which is not shown here, domain is very broad, right? It includes all of these organisms that have a eukaryotic cell. So all of these organisms up here are in the humane domain eukarya. They are all in the kingdom Animalia, because they're all animals. But notice as we move down to phylum, it's like a funnel, right? It starts to get more specific. We lose the sea star, because the sea star is not a chordata, because they don't have a backbone. As we move to class Mammalia, we lose the, the snake, we lose the reptile, because reptiles are not mammals, right? To be a mammal, you need to have hair and mammary glands. Um, as we move down to the order carnivora, we lose the squirrel um, because they are herbivores. And then as we move down to the family Ursidae, we lose the fox because these are only bears. And then we start getting more and more specific um, in the genus Ursos, which only includes the black bears and the grizzly bears, and then down to the species Arctos. So um, as we can see here in this um, funnel, right, we're starting with something that is very um, specific, I'm sorry, so something that is very broad, like domain and kingdom, and we're getting down to something very specific. Now, there is a mnemonic that you can use to remember um, the different 
of phylogeny or classification. So remember that the broadest here is domain. So I like to start with deer, D for domain, king, K for kingdom, uh, Philip, P for phylum, came, C for class, over, O for order, and then um, F for family, G for genus, and S for species. So the, the mnemonic device that I use to help me remember the order of classification, starting from what's very broad and moving down to what's very specific, is uh, this sentence, right? This mnemonic device. Dear King Philip came over for grape soda. Um, some of you might have learned came over for good spaghetti. So whatever works for you, whatever mnemonic device works for you, use it to remember the system of classification starting from broad to very specific. All right, so let's move on. Let's introduce the kingdoms of life. So um, we're going to look at domains in a little bit, but I want to start with kingdoms. And remember, there are six king kingdoms. There hasn't always been six kingdoms, but today there are six kingdoms, and here they are. We have in group one, let's see if you guys can um, classify that kingdom. What do you think they are? Fungi? Nope. Group one are the plants. Um, group two, those probably look like fungi, and yep, that's the uh, kingdom fungi. Group three, well, you know who they are. Those are the animals. Group four, um, you might recognize some of them. Maybe you recognize this amoeba here or this paramecium here. Um, group four are the protists, which are also known as the junk drawer. So sometimes organisms that don't fit in other kingdoms will fit in the kingdom protista. And then we see group five and six, which um, used to all be grouped together as the bacteria um, kingdom, the Monera kingdom, but now um, because of technology, scientists have been able to acknowledge that they are indeed different. So group phi is what we refer to as the eubacteria or just bacteria, which is the common bacteria that you find all over the place inside your bodies, on your desk, on your hands. And then group six would be the archaea bacteria, and this is the bacteria that you find in extreme environments. And we're going to look at some examples in just a moment. So um, who developed this six kingdom of classification? So we know that Carl Linnaeus um, divided all living things into two kingdoms alone. So um, he divided um, plants into plants and then everything else into animals. Uh, Carolus Linnaeus, or Carl Linnaeus, we know is the father of modern taxonomy, and he used this system of classification, but as you can see here, this um, two kingdom system is not very good, right, because we know that there is more diversity in life than just two kingdoms. So um, since then, there have been new discoveries, foremost of which is the advent of the microscope, and we are able to get a better understanding of what the cells actually look like and, of course, of genetics. So taking that into consideration, we've been able to develop um, other kingdoms of life over time. So let's look a little bit at the kingdom timeline. So. The Linnaeus or the Linnaean taxonomy only had a two kingdom classification of plants and animals and all living things were either or. Um, as we moved um, through time, um, we um, or scientists were able to um, expand with the kingdom protista and they included all unicellular organisms in the kingdom protista so they had a three kingdom classification. Um, and then scientists were like, hmm, we can't put the mold and the yeast and the mushrooms with any of them because the, some of them are not unicellular. And we can't put them in plants because they can't undergo photosynthesis. So then they developed a new kingdom, which is the fungi kingdom, and that took you to the four kingdom classification. Um, further studies showed that bacteria were very distinct, and you can't really put the bacteria in the kingdom protista. So then scientists developed a new kingdom called Monera, 
and that took us to the five kingdom classification. So when I was in high school, we still had the five kingdom classification. And then um, scientists realized that bacteria are actually very different. So that um, they divided the Monera kingdom, which was all bacteria, into archaea bacteria and new bacteria. And that's where we got the six kingdom classification that we use today. So um, let's um, look at a little bit of the history here, keeping in mind that this six kingdom classification might potentially change in the future. Who knows? So there are some distinctive characteristics of each kingdom. So if we look at the kingdom plant, um, we can see here that all plants are multicellular, made up of more than one cell. They're all photoautotrophic, which means that they undergo photosynthesis and can make their own food. We see that they all have cell walls, all have cellulose in their cell walls. So um, when we think of plants, right, whether it's a cactus, a sunflower, a tree, or a, um, a plant with an actual flower, or a pine tree, we think of them as belonging in the kingdom plantae or plant. When we think of the kingdom animalia, that would be us, um, we think of all animals as being multicellular. Um, made up of more than one cell. They all lack a cell wall. They're all heterotrophic, including us, right? We cannot make our own food. We have to ingest the food that we eat. Um, and here are just some examples of the varying characteristics which, within the kingdom Animalia. And we know that we have either animals that are aquatic, live in the water, or terrestrial, live on land. Moving along, we have the kingdom fungi. Um, in the kingdom fungi, we know that they're all heterotrophic. They cannot make their own food. Um, none of them photosynthesize. We know that they have cell walls, but the cell wall is made up a little bit different than plants. They're made up of this substance called chitin. Um, and one thing that we know about um, fungi is that most of them are terrestrial and oops and let me come back here and um, not all of them are multicellular because we know that yeast are unicellular so another thing that we can include in the kingdom fun fungi is that some are unicellular so let me write that down so some are unicellular and most are multicellular Okay, that's another characteristic that we can include here. All right, in looking at the kingdom eubacteria, um, we've studied the structure of a prokaryotic cell, so that would be a bacteria cell. Notice that they're all unicellular. They are all prokaryotic, so they lack that nucleus. Um, they all reproduce asexually through binary fission. They all have a cell wall. And um, the cell wall is made up of this component known as peptidoglycan. And we know that the um, some bacteria, with some bacteria can be beneficial for us, but some bacteria are pathogenic or they're pathogens and can make us sick, like the bacteria that causes strep throat. Um, then we have a different type of bacteria, and this is the archaea bacteria within the kingdom archaea. And these are all unicellular bacteria, and again, all prokaryotic, no nucleus. But um, um, there's, there's something different about them. Even though they have a cell wall, the cell wall is not made up of peptidoglycan. So they lack peptidoglycan. Um, so that, that there's something about that characteristic that makes that bacteria non-pathogenic. So it's not bacteria that's going to make you sick. Now, this bacteria lives in very um, extreme environments, so in environments that are very hot, like um, hot springs, and these are thermophiles, or environments that are very um, deep and without light, um, uh, like deep sea, vent, sea vents where there's also a lot of pressure and when there's a lot of chemicals there emerging from these deep sea vents. 
And um, we also have bacteria that like to live in salty environments. And these are the halophiles or salt-loving bacteria. Okay, none are known to cause disease, like I just said. All right, and then we have the kingdom Protista, and this is the catch-all or the junk drawer kingdom. And um, what doesn't neatly fit into another kingdom is going to go here. So because of that, there is a great deal of variety within the kingdom Protista. So we have um, fungus-like protists, so they resemble fungus, but they're not in the kingdom fungi. We have animal-like protists, so they share some of the characteristics of the animals, but they're not animals, like this paramecium here. And we have the plant-like protists, and this is where we find um, protists that are, resemble some characteristics of plants, like algae. Um, they are protists, but they're not true plants. So here we see this aquatic algae, and there's different types of algae. We know that algae are protists. So um, look at this classification conundrum, right? With cell walls and without cell walls, heterotrophic and photoautotrophic, unicellular and multicellular. Some of them reproduce sexually and some reproduce asexually. Most are aquatic, but some are terrestrial. So that's what we call it the catch-all. And... Um, Moving on here to the three domain system. So remember when we talked about the three domain system, we said domains are the broadest type of classification. So we didn't have the domain system until recently. So this is part of the modern taxonomy. So the domain system um, was proposed by Carl Woese. He was an American microbiologist and biophysicist who is most famously known for distinguishing archaea as a new distinct grouping of life apart um, from eubacteria, both of which were originally grouped as monarans or the monera kingdom. So he said, wait a minute, they are different bacteria. They cannot be grouped into monera. Um, let's do these um, other ways to classify them and let's separate them because they are so different. So in, uh, he renamed, he renamed, renamed you bacteria as just bacteria and archaea bacteria as just archaea um, stating that they were no longer grouped together as the types of bacteria or monera so that's where we get the domain system of archaea and um, bacteria so he used a phylogenetic taxonomy as well as the analysis of ribosomal RNA to help define the three domain system of life. So here we see this very broad system of life where we have bacteria as a domain, archaea as a domain, and eukaryota or eukarya as another domain. Okay, so this three domain system gives bacteria and archaea, their own domain, while grouping protists, fungi, plants, and animals into one domain called the eukaryotic domain. So um, here in brown in the eukaryotic, we see the animal, the fungi, and the plants, and other organisms here that you don't need to worry about. The branches of the domains get revised as new data becomes available. So together, the six kingdoms of life and the three domain system form the framework for modern day taxonomy. So here we see it, the six kingdoms of life, and here we see it, the three domain system. And where are we? We are in the domain eukaryota or eukarya. So I want you to, uh, here in closing, examine these two diagrams closely. How do they represent the change from older ways of thinking about and classifying life to newer ways of thinking about and classifying life? So I'll let you look at this for a moment. What do you notice? What do you see? So here on the left, we see an ego way of classifying life. And notice that in this ego way of classifying life, where is human? 
where are the humans? Well, humans are at the top here of the pyramid, but notice that man is a little bit higher up in classification here than females are, right? And then you see all these or other organisms fall under that human, right? So this is an egotistical way of thinking about life, right? So um, it's, a, it's a classist way of thinking about life, thinking that one organism is superior of, over another organism. As we understand ecology and as we understand how we fit into our world, we have to think of more of an eco or an ecological way of thinking. Yeah, we are part of this environment. We are part of this ecosystem, but we are just, as that says, part of it, right? We form part of an ecological balance and relationship with other organisms. We are not at the top of the pyramid, right? Because our actions affect other organisms and these other organisms very well affect us. So we need to think as us as fitting into an ecosystem and being part of this ecosystem and understanding that our actions have repercussions within that ecosystem, not in an egotistical way thinking that we are better than uh, all other organisms. So um, one of the last things we're going to look at today are dichotomous keys and you're going to practice this today in, um, in the class activity. And dichotomous keys are keys that allow us to classify organisms. Now remember that there are billions of organisms out there. So if an organism is discovered, how is a scientist going to be able to classify them as being part of the animal kingdom or the um, protista kingdom? And even when you go down to genus species, it's going to be even harder to classify. So a dichotomous key is a, is a key that allows us to look at certain characteristics. And these characteristics are given in pairs or cu couplets. And then you look at the characteristics and then you see which one fits the organism best. So let's look at the dichotomous key here. So let's say we're trying to um, classify this organism. And let's just pretend for a moment that we don't know what this organism is. So we start with number one and we say, well, does this organism have tentacles? And if it has tentacles, we go to number two. If it doesn't have tentacle, then we go to number three. Okay, so we know that yes, it has tentacles. So we are going to move to number two. And then we're gonna ask ourselves the next, next couplet questions. Does this organism have eight tentacles or does this organism have more than eight tentacles? So since the answer is that this organism have, has eight tentacles, we can say that this organism is known as, a, as an octopus. So that's an easy way to classify an organism here using this dichotomous key. Right? So let's try another one. Let's try, um, let's see, is this one even in here? Actually, I don't see this one, so um, I don't see it in the key. So let's try let's try another one. Let's try this one. Um, so this one up here, let's start again. Oh, let me clear everything. So let's try to classify this one. So does it have tentacles present or no tentacles present? Um, and the answer is yes, it has tentacles present. We go to two. Does it have eight tentacles or more than eight? And we know that it has more than eight. Um, so um, we now can move to three. And in three, are the do the tentacles hang down or do the tentacles go upright? And the answer is that they go upright, right? So we can classify this organism as a sea anemone. So um, you're going to try some of these dichotomous keys in class. You're going to get some practice on how to classify organisms. All right, everyone. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video lesson. If you need to go back and rewatch certain parts of the video, then um, go ahead.